Hello, and welcome to another episode of DW Fast Track, the podcast where lawyers discuss all things legal and trending. I'm your host, Suzanne Sukar, a member in Dickinson Wright's Ann Arbor office focusing on immigration. And I'm here with Najah Alam, an attorney in Dixon Wright's Detroit office. In this week's episode, we will be discussing the H-2B seasonal worker visa. Welcome to our second employment-based immigration podcast. If you didn't check out our first immigration podcast on H-1B visas as a solution for schools facing teacher shortages, then you may not want to miss that one. My name is Suzanne Sukar, and I will be your host. I have been practicing immigration law for almost 20 years, and I'm based in Dickinson Wright's Ann Arbor office. Hi, my name is Najah Alaham. I am also a business immigration lawyer practicing immigration law for about five years based out of Dickinson Wright's Detroit office. We have represented clients across several industries with H-2B sponsorships. It's a visa category that most people don't have a lot of information about. Suzanne, can you tell us what an H-2B visa is? Thanks, Nadra. And I I think you're all right. And I'd be happy to explain some of the basics of what an H-2B visa is. H-2B is a non-immigrant work visa. And when we say non-immigrant, really, it means just it's a temporary worker visa program that allows employers to hire foreign workers for non-agricultural jobs tied to a seasonal or short-term need. And this one, again, it's only for non-agricultural jobs. There is an H-2A, which is separate, related, but separate, which does focus on agricultural jobs. So if you think about all of the industries that require seasonal or short-term need, and that includes things like hospitality, go to those resorts on your vacation, and you see individuals working there that may have those nice little name tags with the country of origin, or hotels, restaurants, and bars. And you know, really think of places where in the summer months, it may be super busy compared to the rest of the year. Or in the winter, if you're thinking of ski lodges and seasonal workers that may be there construction and landscaping and sports. And those are just to name a few of the types of industries that really have more of this sort of seasonal or short-term need. And the H-2Bs are also unique in how the fiscal year lottery is conducted. In our first episode of our podcast on H-1Bs, you know, Najah, you touched upon what the fiscal year lottery looks like. And here, the government fiscal year, it's still October 1 to September 30. That doesn't change. But in the context for the H-1Bs, when you can file an H-1B petition on April 1, assuming that they were selected in the lottery that's conducted in March, here it's a little bit different. The H-2B fiscal year is actually split into two. It runs from October 1 to March 31st, and then from April 1st to September 30th. And the lottery is held twice a year. If you want to talk about March Madness, which we like to talk about in our H-1B context, well, you're getting double March Madness here when you file depending on an employer's anticipated start date. So Najah, we mentioned that an employer must tie their reason for needing the H-2B workers to a specific need. And the USCIS actually provides guidance on the different type of need you can claim when requesting H-2B workers. Can you elaborate on some of the different types of need? Yeah, there are actually four different types of need. And in order to qualify, your need has to be tied to either a seasonal peak load, one-time occurrence, or intermittent need. One-time occurrence, you need to show that you have not hired workers for this specific position in the past, and you won't need to hire them in the future. They are needed just to come and perform a one-time project. And this is the only of the four that will allow for employment past eight or nine months, because typically with the H-2B program, anything more than eight to nine months would be considered temporary. So for an example, you can think of a construction company who wants to hire a stained glass expert to renovate a church that they have been hired hired to do. And they wouldn't need that stained glass expert in the past. They wouldn't need them in the future. They just need them for this one specific job. The next is seasonal need. Now, I know it says seasonal, but it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to your typical summer, fall, winter, spring. It can include things like Christmas season, football season. And essentially, you have to show that your need for these H-2B workers are tied to a specific time of the year by event or pattern. And it should be predictable, meaning it reoccurs at the same time every year. 
A good example of this is a ski resort that is open, you know, just for winter months, maybe four or five months of the year. They can hire H2B workers to fill some of their positions. The next is peak load need. So unlike seasonal, peak load does not require the need to be predictable, but it should be tied to a short term or peak load demand. Unlike seasonal, you do have to show evidence of a permanent staff performing the same duties. And here you are essentially asking USCIS to supplement your permanent staff due to this peak load need. So you aren't adding them as permanent employees, just supplementing current staff. And a good example would be, you know, a landscaping company who hires 20 landscapers year round to perform their services. And based on the upcoming schedule, it looks like they're going to need an additional 10 landscapers to finish their job so they can hire H2B workers for their busier months. And the last is intermittent. The need must be occasional. You can't have hired permanent staff for it in the past or you don't plan on hiring them in the future. Imagine the Lions were to go to the Super Bowl and they hired a specific company to design these shirts. They would just need these workers occasionally, intermittently, just on the super rare occasion to do this job. One question I feel like we get a lot is the difference between seasonal and peak load need because they do sound very familiar. So it is possible for an employer to have both a seasonal and peak load need. So it could be that they are busiest in the summer, but that is also their peak load month. Employers will ask, you know, which one should we go with? And I think the two biggest factors are predictability and the presence of a permanent staff. So if your clients need is predictable, I would lean towards seasonal. If it's not predictable, lean towards peak load. And what type of evidence are they going to be able to provide when come time to file this H-2B petition? They'll be required to provide pay statements, pay records, evidence of overtime, all of these documents to kind of evidence that peak load needs. So I think those are two things you should be looking at to determine the difference. So the different types of H-2B specific need can be confusing. So it's important to talk to an experienced immigration attorney to properly set up the strategy. Suzanne, can you touch on why an H-2B solution may be important to employers and some of the requirements? Yeah, thank you, Nija, for that summary. And I agree. And, you know, why it's important for employers too. And your example with the Detroit Lions was really just the best. It was intermittent, but you know what? I think they need to plan on it being intermittent again next year and get some of those Super Bowl win t-shirts ready from now. But yeah, there, there, there are certain reasons or advantages to why a company may land with one strategy over another, which you touched upon. And it takes careful, not only short, but long-term planning as well for companies as they grow and they develop and want to recruit and, and train employees. You know, this one's important. H2B is important because there's a lot of talk about H1B visas and some of the other visa categories. I mean, our first podcast was on H1Bs because that really is the bread and butter for most employers when it comes to hiring professional workers. And this one's often overlooked and it can be extremely helpful for employers who go through patterns of high or low seasons or traffic. And so this is a tool that they can look to as another option. And unlike most of the other non-immigrant petitions and workers' visa solutions, the H-2B does not require the employee, the foreign worker, to hold a professional degree or a certain level of education or experience. And that's huge. Like, I can't tell you and stress how often and how important it is that the first thing we talk about is the education and the experience, because the vast majority of visa solutions in the United States have some component of education of a skilled workforce. But here, you don't have to worry about a skilled workforce because you can hire uh, or professional workforce, you can hire skilled workers. And it really does help fill labor shortages in industries like the hospitality and the construction and landscaping, and even for those sports teams who may need a little bit of a boost every now and then um, to meet workforce needs where, you know, it isn't enough, where there aren't enough local U.S. workers available. So, you know, we, we've touched upon the different types of need, why it's important, but, you know, what are some of the requirements of the H2B visa? We spent some time talking about all those other issues, but, you know, what do you need to get to the H-2B visa? The H-2B workers have to be part of eligible countries to participate. 
not all countries around the world are actually authorized to participate. The Department of Homeland Security issues the list of countries. So an employer is looking to bring in H2B workers. They have to do their recruitment through or bring in H2B workers through one of these eligible countries. And I think the hardest part for employers is this point is that it has to be a temporary or limited time. So there are the peak season, the seasonal need and, and, and so forth, but the work cannot exceed nine months unless it's a one-time occurrence. And for some industries, they want to be able to bring the H2B workers back or then they really like them and it needs to be longer duration. And so that can be a challenge sometimes, but with proper planning and consultation with the immigration attorney, you can work on that and talk strategy. The other piece of it too is, is like an H-1B, the H-2B also has a prevailing wage requirement and the H-2B workers must be treated the same as U.S. workers holding the same position. And that's just true across the board. You cannot treat your foreign workers any differently than how you would treat the U.S. workers. You know, how do you obtain the H-2B visa? We talked about quotas on the H-1B side. There's also quotas on the H-2B side. I mean, there are generally 66,000 visas allotted each year. And there are some additional visas allotted. There's a few extra exemption, sort of like the Chile and Singapore exemption with carve out for H-1Bs. In the H-2B context, there's something called the Northern Triangle. And the Northern Triangle includes countries El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And so that gives an additional visa boost for workers coming from that area or have held H-2B status in one of the last three fiscal years. And some are exempt from the lottery if they have held H-2B status in the last fiscal year. So if you're an employer really thinking about pursuing H-2B visas to supplement your workforce, and we know that it can be very daunting, it's a time-consuming process, you hear about the requirements, and it can be very overwhelming and scary, but we have some tips. And number one, seek an experienced <laughs> immigration attorney. That's really why we're here. We have the knowledge to be able to get you through this. And the one thing we always, always say when, when you're working in immigration is, you know, plan early. It can require a lot of preparation and planning, and it's a time-sensitive process. So you want to be able to start well in advance of the time you need to account for any issues that may arise. And it is a complicated process, and it's involving three different government agencies. We're working through the Department of Labor and then the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And finally, the Department of State to get over the finish line with the issuance of the visas. And it, it can take six months or more to plan accordingly. So it may not be a solution for you today. It may be a solution down the road. Things that you would need to think about are like, where are you going to recruit your workers from? Will you be hiring a recruitment agency? Uh, will you be providing housing to the workers or assist them in obtaining housing or, for example, block room rates? So identifying your need early. Sometimes the employer needs can fall into more than one category, Naja, as you had discussed at length, and we need to help look at that information and say, what makes most sense for you? How are we splitting up the fiscal year for the first or the second part? Identifying where the workers will come from. Are they going to be out-of-country workers? Will they be in-country workers that are exempt from the H-2B workers? Where will you find them? Are you using the Northern Triangle? So there's a lot of questions that really need to be addressed and helping you plan how you want to map out using an H-2B program. It can feel overwhelming and daunting, but again, that's something we're here for. And if it's something that you're considering, and we'd be happy to be able to have a conversation. Thanks for tuning in today. We hope that you found this information helpful. And if you need legal guidance, we are here and we're happy to help navigate through the complex season of H-2Bs. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this episode of DW Fast Track. For more information, visit our website at www.dickinsonwright.com or check out our social media channels.